What does it feel like to walk the distance from the entry gate all the way back to where the Jewish section is? That there is this rich and largely untapped uh, history that is documented. The Oakwoods, uh, it dates back to the 1850s. So if you can imagine, this is the south side of Chicago before it's an urban area, before it's part of the city even. It's a moment in kind of the history of American cemeteries in which this kind of movement of the lawn cemeteries is on the ascendance and in vogue. Uh, so there's an architect called Adolf Stauch, and he uh, is hired to design Oak Woods as a lawn cemetery, as a park. So that's sort of how it becomes this beautiful um, natural environment or kind of built natural environment, right, with uh, ponds and trees and landscaping as a central feature of, uh, that makes it into a kind of green space as well as a cemetery that serves the community. The first Jewish part of it is outside of the official Oakwood Cemetery boundaries, but directly adjacent to it. It's like right along 71st Street, and that belonged to the Ohav Shalom Mariupol congregation beginning in 1874, so pretty shortly after the Oakwood Cemetery itself was established, this pretty small congregation in Chicago established their own Jewish cemetery, and it couldn't be owned by Oakwood Cemetery because it had to be owned by Jews, uh, and so they just put it right next to the existing cemetery. So this congregation, Ohav Sholem Mariupol, was located in the what was the Maxwell Street neighborhood in uh, Chicago. Not everyone who was buried there was from the town of Mariupol, which is in Lithuania, but it was part of a, uh, the congregation grew out of a Landsmannschaft, an organization of people who were all from the same town, and then it kind of grew from there to people who joined who were from Chicago proper, and that's why it has that name. We don't know a lot about the people who are buried in that part, and it really speaks to, I think, the way that a lot of history is just unrecoverable. There is the stones themselves are deteriorating. It's kind of hard even to read uh, what's there. There aren't good records of who is buried there. Communities that, that existed on the South Side and South Shore and Woodlawn and Hyde Park as Jewish communities in Chicago, but then sort of as the city transforms and, and uh, the lives of Jews in the cities change, these communities move away, they move west, north, to the northern suburbs, ultimately. Um, and these kinds of spaces, like the cemetery, like the synagogues, uh, are left behind. But there's something about a cemetery and its permanence that forces everyone to kind of come back to the beginning, to this early settlement, um, and this idea of, of like having a kind of rootedness in Chicago, which I think is something that we don't often think about for the Jewish community because they are largely an immigrant communities. It has this kind of immutability, and that's one of the things that interests me a lot about a space like the Jewish Cemetery in Oak Woods, how it functions as a kind of um, remnant or documentation, a trace that we can learn from. In 1956, something really interesting happens, and which is that they erect a monument there to the people who, who died, who perished in World War II, which included U.S veterans and also victims of the Holocaust. It's a cemetery with a lot of monuments, and there's a way in which the Jewish community putting a monument there is sort of integrating itself into the fabric of the rest of the cemetery. The Holocaust monument is one of the earliest Holocaust memorials or monuments that was built in the United States or indeed anywhere. It comes relatively early in the, the sort of the history of memorialization of the Holocaust. The monument itself, it's made up of six red granite shafts that go 20 feet in the air and they form a Star of David uh, on the dome that has little solar panels, which must have been pretty exciting new technology at that point. And that's why it was called the Eternal Light Monument. And Eternal Light is something that you would find in a synagogue to symbolize the eternality of God. And so this is a taking that symbology of the synagogue with the eternal light over the Torah scrolls and putting that in a cemetery. The plaque that's in the middle of this monument has two different texts on it. The English says, uh, in memory of the more than six million Jewish martyrs of World War II. 
And every ch choice here is interesting, right? They're described as martyrs, and they are martyrs of World War II. This is before the term Holocaust was in wide circulation, and they didn't use it. The Hebrew says something quite different. It says, These are formulaic uh, sort of expressions. This, this is kind of language that they're using from a given context. It's language that comes from a long history of speaking about um, Jewish victims of, of uh, communal violence. And it says, in memory of our brothers, the people of Israel, who gave their souls for the sanctification of the Lord. May God avenge their blood. So unlike the English, first of all, where the English says martyrs, the Hebrew here uh, specifies that these are people who gave their souls to sanctify God. And it also mentions the notion of uh, revenge, which does not appear in the English at all. If you can go, you can read the name of someone on a gravestone, and then you're like, oh, I wonder who this person was and what they did. Let me just Google it. But like, of course, you can't find it. It really brings home how much gets lost over time, as well as how much remains. So this is sort of a a cultural treasure that exists on the South Side, but it's also, it's just an incredibly valuable teaching tool to kind of raise questions for students about the history of the South Side, the different communities that have moved through this, this place, um, the legacies of that long history and how they form our existence in this space today. When we go to cemeteries, generally speaking, we go there for personal reasons, right, and we have we have strong personal associations. We think about the people who have gone before us. We think about times we've buried someone. And I think it can be very hard to pull yourself back from the personal and also think about um, history and, and think about it in kind of like broad sweeping terms. Um, and so I think we under-examine cemeteries because they're hard to look at because they remind us about personal loss or about our own mortality. I'm hoping that this project will help us kind of take ourselves out of ourselves a little bit so that we can think about this grand sweep of history and all the different people who have lived it.